You do not know where you end and the sky begin. I am seated next to an 18-year-old girl in a stylish black trench coat. She loves this coat because its interior is patterned with multicolored circles. And she refers to the coat in her mind as the gumdrop coat. She carries with her a happy yellow hand. A notebook. She is writing in it now. A pack of cigarettes. It will be another eight years before she realizes she doesn't even like smoking. A passport and a one-way ticket to London. In London, she knows no one. She has a room booked in a hostel in Greenwich and around 500 US dollars in her bank account. She had purchased her ticket two weeks prior after notifying her landlord of her departure. The landlord was planning on evicting her anyway. And an adventure awaits her. So does the kindness of strangers. In the cold night, crying in a hostel bed with an empty stomach. Right now, she is riding the high of hypomania, scribbling intensely in her notebook. Excitement and longing mixed in her bloodstream, and an intoxicating cocktail, making her feel lightheaded. Hypomania, we'll call her delirium. We'll dance this girl from the foggy heights of San Francisco to the uneven cobbled streets of Covent Garden. Delirium's driving beat will lead her through a song of blurred London city life, live music, and the sour smell of pub floors baptized in beer. There will be artists, musicians, and lawyers who work in the city. Pretty young Swedish men in a flat filled with mirrors. And shisha sessions from Camden Town. Anywhere in the traveling Germans. Say that five times fast. Say that five times fast after a toast. Perhaps the fluttering fresh air is not far behind. He will catch up with her in delirium. Stepping out of the quiet and the hostel room in North London. Delirium will be the chase on the rise, knowing she has overstepped the boundary this time. And the girl will allow depression to comfort her on a narrow bed with thin sheets, wrapping his strong arms around her and enveloping them in both trash in his dark night. I look away from the young woman riding in her notebook. We cross into the gate seating area with the floor ceiling windows. Over there it's still 1999. There is a scrawny kid with her hair cut boyishly short. Looking out the window. I used to think that I just didn't experience anger. That I possessed a gentle, mild temperament. But when I look back on my early childhood, I discover a passionate, wild, untamed temperament. And a fine anger. I was feisty, stubborn, and contrary. I am reminded of the phrase, mad, bad, and sad. The feisty, contrary kid who was taught they couldn't be mad or bad 
just grew up sad. I am fortunate to be in an era of my life where I am practicing allowing myself to feel anger and what's more to be present with Lo and behold, I have rekindled my passion, feist, and contrariness. Coincidence? I think I have a right to be angry. Angry at how I was conditioned. Angry at myself for being unaware of it for so long. Angry at the person who tried to break me when I was 19. With that, I experienced numbness. I wept, I grieved, I pitied myself. But I had never let myself rage. I never let myself be angry for what had happened. This anger is not without purpose. It isn't harming me or even harming the person who hurt me. It is an energy that is assisting me, burning away with iron strings of attachment I have left to what happened. This is my pleasure. Allowing myself to purely feel no holds barred. Focusing on my anger with the intention to set it free. It is more wild, frenetic, and inconsistent when hypomanic. And it is sharp and angular when depressed. My prose and my poetry reveal ambiguous and sometimes allegorical references to the experiences of deep depression in the wild, frenetic high of hypermania. This was when writing was my refuge. The unique perspective of the world, of myself, that is born of writing has at times been the perspective that saved me from myself. Even now this craft acts as a mirror. Writing is a way to self-reflect. When I lost connection to myself, I hated writing. I no longer knew how to write. It was like waking up one day with amnesia, having forgotten how to speak. I couldn't, wouldn't even read through my past writing. I was never one for pressing on bruises. I carried my notebooks around with me from one home to another. Pieces of myself kept in boxes. Inanimate, but shouting at me. Silence like a cry of terror in the vacuum of space. I edited the writing of others. I read countless books. And I had several friends who were talented writers. I envied all of them. And I resented them. Because they could do what I know. I thought I had been abandoned by my first love, but what actually happened was I abandoned writing when I abandoned myself. I could say I was dealing with the fallout of an abusive relationship, or that I was failing to manage a condition.
condition like bipolar. It was this and that. But it was me. I lost connection to myself. I don't regret experiencing this. I try not to regret anything in my life. I came back to writing and when I did, it embraced me like it had always been there. Because it had always been there. When I look back now, I realize I never stopped writing. Not truly. I was always composing in my mind. My very thoughts take the same shape as my writing. Falling in love with writing again, it is no less passionate than it was before. I find, like myself, like the whiskey in my glass. It is aged and become more nuanced. My writing is no longer a violent waterfall, but the effortless flow of the river. What is your first love? Did you abandon it? Did you come back to it? Was it bittersweet? Do you hate and love with the same passion?
reflection, putting horrible words to her apart.
of space and time.
it feels hard and cold beneath your feet. I know you want to avoid further discomfort. But you've been standing for so long. There's a tremble in your legs. Yeah. Your body feels like too much yeah. to hold up against the force of gravity. And there's a heavy stone in your heart.
Digital Park Music. Music is a universal language.